So now we're going to move from um, hematological adaptations. There's one thing I want to add before we go into GI in regards to hematological adaptations, and that is we are seeing an increased number of parents who are refusing the um, IM injection of vitamin K, and that is problematic, and we have to do more to try to educate parents before um, delivery because after delivery there's not a whole lot of time available for them to think about this because the baby can develop um, symptoms of bleeding you know a day or two after delivery so um, it is important that we start educating them about the need for the vitamin K injection prior to delivery. Now we're going to go into the adaptations of the GI system both gastric emptying and intestinal peristalsis are present before birth. The newborn baby's intestines are sterile, however, at birth. There's no bacteria there. And the newborn baby's stomach will go undergo significant change. Initially, the stomach can hold about 6 milliliters per kilogram, and it's about the size of a marble. Their stomach will increase in size, and that increase will start several days after delivery, and it will expand to hold about 90 milliliters of fluid and about the size of an egg. Their stomach expands to about the size of an egg at the end of about four-week period of time. Their stomach will empty in about two to four-hour blocks of time. And some babies have a more relaxed cardiac sphincter, which can lead them to have increased regurgitation and being more spitty. Usually bowel sounds are present by one hour after birth. Some babies, it may take them a little bit longer, but usually speaking, they have bowel sounds uh, about an hour or so after birth. <clears throat> We do want babies to be on their backs, but if you have a baby who has a lot of regurgitation and spitty, they have a relaxed uh, cardiac sphincter, you can put them on their back and kind of have this tilted angle to them to try to, if they're spitting up a lot, so it can, you know, drain out of their mouth. We don't want them to aspirate and choke on their own secretions. Um, so you can do that, and it will facilitate gastric emptying. Some babies... Um, you know, when you're looking at what mom feeds them, some babies, if mom is breastfeeding, their stool is going to transition from meconium to transitional to that seedy, musty, mustard yellow color with that sweet, sour odor to it. If baby is being bottle fed, then it's going to go from meconium to transitional to uh, yellow to brown and firmer uh, stool with a more sour odor to it. <clears throat> Then you're going to regularly assess how the baby is feeding, how they're tolerating their feeding, assess their bowel sounds, assess her gastric uh, just distension, assess how the baby is able to defecate, and we document how the stool transitions. Some babies are born with a problem. It's called esophageal atresia, where um, the stomach doesn't link up with the with the um, esophagus and so um, the baby when they're taking in feedings and when they're swallowing their own secretions it's actually going down into their lungs and one of the things that you'll notice is during feeding or even when they're swallowing on their own secretions they'll aspirate and get choky and spitty and coughing and gagging um, and so it, if this continues and it doesn't um, fix itself, they'll do further assessment and determine that this indeed is what the baby has. And if they have this problem, then they're going to have to have a surgical repair to um, correct the atresia so that the stomach links up with the throat with the esophagus. Let's go into hepatic symptom uh, system adaptation. We're talking about the liver now. The liver function includes the maintenance of blood glucose levels, conjugation of bilirubin, um, the production needed for uh, blood coagulation, and storage of iron, and the metabolism of drugs. The liver is a very important organ and undergoes significant adaptation for the newborn as well. The newborn baby's liver plays an important role in iron storage, carbohydrate metabolism, and conjugation of, of bilirubin. The term baby has, because the last few weeks of pregnancy, they get kind of a transfusion of iron stores from mom. And those iron stores are there to last that baby for about four to six months. But they get those the last few weeks of pregnancy. Preterm babies do not. And that can increase preterm babies' risk, one of their risks for developing anemia. Blood glucose in the, new, in the newborn baby is stored 
um, in the liver as glycogen when they're inside of mom in the fetal liver and it's there for use uh, for glucose use after birth and the newborn baby at delivery and after they really really need glucose and they need it readily available and needs to be available for their brain and if they do not get enough glucose it can actually cause brain damage so until the newborn baby's feedings are adequate because remember it takes them a while to figure out how to breastfeed they know how to suckle but they to really get a good supply of breast milk and to feed regularly that's a learned skill and until then they're in they're using some of those glycogen stores that are stored in the liver for for their use your babies who are preterm babies babies who are small for gestational age babies who are large for gestational age and babies um, who were born to moms that had diabetes may not have adequate stores of glycogen or even fat for metabolism <clears throat> when you look at conjugation of the bilirubin um, it's also again another major function of the liver it's the a, 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 a source of this is or I should say a byproduct is the breakdown of red blood cells um, as break up as red blood cells are broken down or hemolysized um, the the outcome to that process is bilirubin bilirubin is a toxic substance and the liver has to convert it to a soluble form to be able to get rid of it from the body so it's conjugated bilirubin the baby if the baby's body is not able to convert it to the con to the soluble form to conjugate it bilirubin level it will stay and build up in the bloodstream and it can cause uh, a condition called jaundice and if we are not careful they can go into connectoris but unconjugated bilirubin is the breakdown product of, of destroyed red blood cells so this is kind of how this process works you have red blood cells those red blood cells are broken down and um, they are taken to through the blood it's a complex process but to the liver and in the liver there is an acid that is added to them and <clears throat> at the, the the adding of this acid to the liver helps make it into a conjugated form and that conjugated bilirubin then is, is, is secreted into the bile and then dumped into the intestines and in the intestines the acid is removed by bacteria and this results into converting the bilirubin into another substance basically it once it gets into the intestines it's going to be dumped into the feces and um, eliminated from the body body that way <clears throat> when you look at bilirubin you have two forms you have pathological bilirubin and physiological but let's talk about the pathology of bilirubin um, hyperbilirubinemia or jaundice um, bilirubin can cross the blood-brain barrier so if this uh, level of bilirubin is being built up in the newborn baby's body the baby's body is not able to get rid of it it's not able to conjugate it, it you remember this is toxic so the baby's body starts distributing it or dumping it into the subcutaneous tissues as a way to try to eliminate this um, and but it will still those levels will still be high in the baby's blood and so eventually it will cross the blood brain barrier and once it goes to the brain it can cause irreversible central nervous system damage and that pro that process of when that occurs that is called connectoris <clears throat> This is a picture on autopsy of a, unfortunately, a baby who's passed away from connectoris. What I'm trying to show you is if you see all of this yellow on the baby's uh, brain, the, the central nervous system uh, has a high affinity for bilirubin. It's almost like a magnet to it. And so it will essentially um, uh, attract, it'll uh, go to the, the central nervous system and, and destroy it and the baby will develop irreversible brain damage and they can die from this the relatively immature newborn baby's liver does not conjugate bilirubin well um, they have to develop bacteria in the gut to assist with bilirubin conjugation as and this takes some time to develop <clears throat> 
you have two types of hyperbilirumia. You have physiological jaundice and pathological jaundice. Physiological jaundice is thought to be, um, you know, sometimes it happens with moms who are, you know, with the babies whose moms are breastfeeding. And so the baby may, because they're learning how to do this, it takes them, you know, a couple days to figure out how to really, really breastfeed well. They get a little dehydrated. So when you're looking at physiological jaundice, those symptoms are usually not present during the first 24 hours. Um, and it's this gradual increase in the baby's bilirubin level in their blood. Typically, we can treat this with phototherapy and uh, the baby's level in their blood will drop. It will help the exposure to that light will help um, convert the bilirubin to a conjug you know, conjugated form where the baby's body is able to eliminate it. <clears throat> So then you have pathological jaundice. This is abnormal. It's a rapid rise in the newborn baby's bilirubin level. It Those symptoms start within the first 24 hours. It typically affects babies who are preterm, babies who have um, RH or ABO incompatibility where the baby's RH factor or the baby's blood type is different from the mom's. And so mom makes some antibodies and remember antibodies cross over into the placenta and those antibodies will attack the um, newborn baby's red blood cells and cause more of them to be homologized. So you can have RH or ABO incompatibility. You have low birth weight, weight babies that are increased risk and some babies have a genetic predisposition for pathological jaundice it's called g6pd deficiency and this primarily affects babies of ethnicity including african-american southeast asian greek italian and mediterranean and some jewish families and some chinese families so those babies are increased risk um, but what you're going to see is a bilirubin level that's going to increase rapidly um, and rise very rapidly. And that's due to the abnormally high number of red blood cells that are being destroyed. And what you'll see is this progressive jaundice. It starts in the baby's head and it will progressively, as the bilirubin level, uh, level increases, it will go higher in the baby's body. So you can see this when you blanch the baby's skin. You can see um, a normal baby, when you blanch their skin, there's no yellowing. But a baby who has jaundice, when you blanch their skin, you'll see this, this yellowing in their skin. And um, as they prog as this progresses, they will get more and more yellow, and it again starts in the head and will progressively go down the baby's body to the point where when it crosses over into the blood-brain barrier, you have a baby that starts developing conicterus. They'll start with they'll you know get abdominal distension, and they can you know be quite quite ill. <clears throat> So how we used to assess uh, bilirubin is changed. We used to it used to be subjective, where you know one nurse might say that baby looks a little yellow to me, and another nurse will say no, that baby's fine. Um, and because of the subjectivity, we needed a way to, to more objectively assess for bilirubin. And so you have what's called a jaundice meter, and most facilities use this. Um, and so you'll have to depress this device against the baby's skin. Usually they'll have you do it on the baby's head or on the baby's chest. And <clears throat> when you do this, it will give you a reading in the little a screen and you record that number and most hospitals have it within their protocols when the baby's level gets to a certain level because you're going to plot this um, either you put it in the computer or you plot it on a graph when this baby's um, bilirubin level gets to a certain level that's considered high then they're going to have where they're going to obtain a blood sample usually they prick the baby's foot will take uh, a blood sample and send it to the lab to determine what is the true bilirubin level in their baby's blood and if it's considered if it's determined that it's high um, they're going to want to start therapy but again remember I said to you jaundice typically starts um, in the face in the head and as their level gets higher in their blood it the yellowing of their skin is going to to spread downward so usually in the head and the face it's not so much of a big deal but when it goes further down the baby's body um, and it gets like down into their legs and, and you know, into to their feet. That baby's bilirubin level is really high. Um, so we can 
assess it by jaundice level you can also looking at the baby look uh, look that baby's level we think is really high we need to draw uh, a serum bilirubin level and then they will initiate putting the baby under billy lights and exposure to that light will help um conjugate that bilirubin it help convert it to a conjugatable form where the baby can eliminate um the bilirubin level in the feces <clears throat> so what you're seeing is a baby and if you look here you can see in the baby's face in the upper part of the baby's body the baby's more yellow but the lower portion of the baby's coloring is fine where this little girl it is all the way down her body even into her um, arms into her legs and I think her abdomen is a little bloated I think she's um, her, her level would be quite high <clears throat> So if the baby's level is high and they determine the baby has to uh, be exposed to the billy lights and there's different types. You can have single billy lights, you can have double billy lights and the baby can actually lay on a billy ribbon bed where the mattress uh, emits a light or they'll lay on a billy blanket which will emit the light. Um, that light really helps uh, break down that billy ribbon. Um, so you're going to care for them you want to watch the baby's temperature watch their hydration status make sure the baby is eating we want to protect their eyes and their genitalia and remember just because they're under the lights we, we still have to turn them like you would an adult every two hours so this is a little girl meeting her baby sister for the first time under the billy lights it, it's important to, for the families to know that even though the baby's under the lights it's still their baby and we still want them to bond with them but they need to be exposed to this light so you see the baby in the picture to your right where the baby has the little eye mask on that's protecting the baby's eyes and you want to have a diaper on them uh, to protect their genitalia some facilities will have even special billy rubin diapers you're not not going to see that in a lot of facilities but I have seen it in some where they're just a little bit thinner to allow for more exposure of the light to the baby's skin most places though just use normal newborn baby diapers if we can't get the baby's bilirubin level to drop they may have to do what's called an exchange transfusion for severe, severe hyperbilirubinemia and that's where this level is just really really high and they're really worried about this baby developing connectoris so what they will do is they will insert um, a catheter in the umbilical vein and they will pull off some of the baby's blood that has the high amount of bilirubin uh, in it and they will replace that blood with donor blood which has a, not a lot of bilirubin in it right it's uh, blood that someone has donated and that will actually force the level of bilirubin that is in that baby's body to drop there are some reasons a baby can develop um, hyperbilirubinemia, but one of the main reasons that you'll see, and this becomes a factor um, for mom and baby, but that is if you have a difference in blood type. So if you have an Rh negative woman who um, she and an Rh positive man conceive a child, the Rh negative woman may have an RH positive fetus and those cells from that baby the first time she has a baby it's just a small amount of that baby's blood is exposed to mom's blood at the time of delivery but then she becomes sensitized and she develops antibodies to fight that RH positive blood cells and her subsequent pregnancies if she has an RH positive baby her antibodies which were made during that first pregnancy will cross over um, the placenta into the developing baby and will attack its red blood cells and she can actually miscarry so if this is the case if we think mom is Rh negative and um, the baby is Rh positive they're going to give mom a medication it's called Rogam R um, R H O G A M to to prevent um, to prevent her from developing these antibodies towards that blood type and we have 72 hours after uh, delivery to do this to try to keep her from becoming sensitized and making these antibodies another problem you can have is abo compatibility where mom has a different blood type than the baby does and again she makes blood uh, antibodies toward that blood type <clears throat> 
When you compare these two problems, RH factor versus H, uh, ABO incompatibility, RH incompatibility is a much more serious problem. Um, not that ABO incompatibility isn't a problem, but the, the baby in ABO compatibility will have increased destruction of the red blood cells, some anemia, some jaundice, but they typically can be treated and be fine, whereas um, RH incompatibility can cause subsequent losses of pregnancy um, and she may not be able to carry a baby to term or if she does the baby can develop a, a, a significant problem uh, because of the uh, the repetitive destruction of its developing red blood cells. Some of the other things that you can see with a newborn baby when you're looking at liver function is the risk of the baby becoming um, hypoglycemic Babies that are born to moms who have diabetes have a real high risk of this, and babies who are small for gestational age. But what happens when mom has diabetes is sometimes it's really hard to control her sugar. So you have babies in utero that are just getting a lot of sugar um, that is that is transferred to the baby because of mom's diabetes. And then at the time of delivery, um, the umbilical cord is cut and that baby's blood sugar plummets because they're not used to, they're accustomed to having a lot of sugar in their circulatory system because of mom's diabetes. So there'll be an increased risk for developing hypoglycemia or babies who are not being fed as frequently as they should be, you might see this. So you might notice a baby who's jittery um, and it, jitteriness is different than just normal newborn babies uh, movements. You might see respiratory difficulties, a drop in their temperature, poor sucking or poor feeding ability. They may be lethargic and pale. You might see decreased reflexes such as decreased ability to swallow. They may have a high pitched but weak cry. Um, and so we need to assess their blood sugar. Some babies because of the risk are put on a low blood sugar protocol. So we have to check their blood sugar every three hours before they eat and then, um, and then we feed them. And we wanna assess, we want their blood sugar not to be below 40 to 45. Some hospitals, the protocol is 40, others it's 45, but that's your window. You don't want them any lower than that. Um, and then we're gonna feed them. Um, I have, if you want to click on these links, you can see what jitteriness looks like in a newborn baby. <clears throat> so some interventions that we're going to do, we're going to maintain safe glucose levels to prevent brain damage. Um, remember that milk provides a longer lasting supply of glucose than sugar water. So you typically won't see sugar water in the newborn nursery environment. Um, so we, we'd prefer to feed them either breast milk or formula. And then we want to repeat the, glu test, the glucose testing to make sure their blood sugar is, is stable. Keep in mind that some diagnoses such as neonatal absence syndrome, some central nervous system disorders or infection or metabolic disorders can have hypoglycemia as a symptom. <clears throat> We're not going to go into the renal adaptations that the newborn baby undergoes. Um, when you look at renal adaptations, kidney development uh, takes place um, in utero. The placenta, though, eliminates the fetal waste. The nephrons are maturing. They begin to function about 35 weeks of gestation. I mean, they function well about 35 weeks of gestation. But compared to an adult or an older child, the nephrons and the kidneys of a newborn baby are structurally um, they're structurally mature but functionally immature. And so they may have more frequent voiding because newborn babies don't have the ability to concentrate urine. So they may have a low specific gravity. Initially when they start urinating, it, there will be little or no smell or little or no color to it. It will develop as the baby gets older. Because of the immaturity of the um, nephrons in the baby's kidneys, um, blood flow to the kidneys will increase after birth. Um, but because they're immature, substances such as protein, such as glucose, may escape in the urine because of the immaturity of the newborn baby's kidneys. <clears throat> newborn babies sometimes uh, will pass what's called urate, urate crystals or uric acid crystals. It, and this is kind of what they look for. It's look like. It's hard to like show you this because it looks to me more like a dust than a staining. Um, and it'll leave this red-orange 
kind of dusty appearance or staining in the newborn baby's diaper which can alarm the parents because sometimes they think it's bleeding and it's not it's just your eight crystals and it's a normal finding <clears throat> so when you look at fluid balance and adaptation in the newborn baby newborn babies have a lower tolerance for changes in their total uh, volume of, of body fluid than adults and the fluid turnover rate is greater than in adults so at birth, about 70% of their body is composed of water. As their intake increases, their output will increase and the urine will become, um, it will change and become more straw colored as they get older. <clears throat> so this is your second math problem that you need to learn. So um, we talked about we talked about weight loss and that problem. So I want you to use that same problem before but keep in mind that the fluid requirements for babies change. So the first two days of life, the newborn baby needs 60 milliliters of fluid per kilogram. And after the first two days of life, um, they need 100 to 150 milliliters per kilogram. When you look at the immune system of the newborn baby, the newborn um, baby system is immature compared to that of an older child. The response of the web white blood cells is different. It's not as rapid. And that's due to the baby's um, brain being Im immature. And so um, the brain controls the inflammatory response. And in newborn babies, that response can be slower than in older children. So the normal things that would tell you we might have an infection or inflammatory response, such as a fever, may not be the first thing you notice in a newborn baby because the inflammatory response is slower than the older child. Um, in utero, the fetus receives pa passive immunity uh, when IgG crosses the placenta. Uh, they also get a transfusion of antibodies from mom during the uh, third trimester. During the last few weeks of pregnancy, they get this transfusion of antibodies from mom, and that actually gives them some protection. Um, they also get passive immunity for bacterial and viral infections if mom is breastfeeding, and they will get um, passive immunity to bacterial and viral infections, which mom has formed specific antibodies to. But their period of immunity really varies depending on whether mom is breastfeeding or bottle feeding. So when you look at these immunoglobulins, uh, such as IgG, IgM, IgE, and IgA, IgG crosses the placenta. IgA is secreted in the colostrum and breast milk. IgM does not cross the placenta, and it can be indicative of a utero infection if elevated. Baby also has some other protective mechanisms as well, such as vernix, caseosa, which covers their skin. Also, their skin and mucous membranes offer some protection as well. And the most important thing that we can do to prevent and protect newborn babies from infection is wash our hands. And uh, children and adults who have known infections should be encouraged to not really be around the baby until the baby is a little bit older because the baby, babies don't have the ability to fight infections like an older child will. And this is a good example of a newborn baby being around a child and then the baby, the newborn baby contracts, you know, chicken pox. That can be a fatal infection for a newborn baby. So we really want to encourage people who are ill or with known infections infections or such as the flu or cold or whatever maybe right now is not the time to see the baby maybe come and see the baby when they're not ill so that we can uh, make sure that the baby um, is able to develop its immunity and you know maybe when the baby gets a little bit older it's a better time for them to be able to visit with the baby <clears throat> And we're going to go into endocrine adaptations. Um, the baby gets residual hormones from mom. Remember I talked to you before about the baby being inside of mom uh, when they're in utero and some of mom's making some of mom's hormones making its way into the baby's body and the baby's body responds. This can be seen in what's called pseudo menstruation where in your little female babies, remember they were inside of mom, some of um mom's hormones makes its way into the baby's body and then the baby's body responds. Give this baby a couple days that hormone level will tap off it'll drop and go away and pseudo menstruation will go away. 
Then we're going to go into the neurological system and uh, the reflexes. And we really talked about the reflexes more in physical assessment. So I'm not going to go over those again. I want to talk more about um, the immaturity of the neurological system. Uh, their neurons are all present at the time of birth, but it really takes a good four years for their neurons to fully myelinate. The newborn baby's brain is about the fourth of the size of an adult brain, and their brain is uncoordinated. It has labile temperature control, and they have poor control over their musculature. But the baby is going to rapidly develop during this newborn uh, period of time, and so they will develop <clears throat> control over their musculature, they will develop um, more control over um, over their temperature, but this is going to take time. <coughs> Excuse me. When you look at their, their senses, their visual response, term babies and newborn babies can process complex visual information. They can track objects in space. They can defend against unpleasant visual stimuli. We know that they prefer complex visual stimuli, patterns, geometric shapes, such as the human face. We don't know exactly their acuity. We can estimate it uh, based on research. We do know that they have a well-developed auditory response system. Um, they habituate or they will turn or orient to sounds that they hear. They can discriminate between women's voices. They can recognize their own mother's voice. And they prefer low frequency sounds and soothing sounds versus high frequency sounds. They also have well-developed olfactory response. They prefer sweet odors such as milk over noxious ones such as cigarettes, but babies really should not be um, exposed to cigarette smoke because that increases the risk of development of SIDS. And we think their olfactory response helps the baby root towards the nipple. <clears throat> In evaluating their taste, research tells us that babies prefer sweet tastes over salty tastes, and if they're exposed to something sweet, they will suckle more frequently, um, and they can have variations in their sucking patterns. They notice this with breastfed babies versus uh, bottle-fed babies. <clears throat> In addition, babies response, respond to touch. Um, they respond to, to tactile stimulation. Um, you can see this like if a baby is upset and they're crying, you can we can soothe them by and quiet them by stroking them and pat, uh, patting them and talking to them. Um, and there is some research as to how babies respond differently in touch in touch to men and women. They're both positive responses, but they can respond differently. It's kind of an interesting research study. <clears throat> You know, the unborn babies, babies go through periods of reactivity. Generally, you see these, especially within the first 24 hours. And it can be influenced by the labor and delivery experience if mom was given any medications during the interpartal period of time. Um, but the first period of reactivity, which begins at birth, it's usually the first 30 to 60 minutes. You might see the baby active, alert, awake, gazing towards the 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 parents actively rooting and suckling and looking around um, and you might see some slight differences in their heart rate <clears throat> um, so during that first period of reactivity um, their eyes may be quiet and alert and bright and they focus on faces especially the mother's face um, you might see bursts of movement they may have like little bursts of crying strong sucking reflexes and they may act hungry but then the baby's going to fall asleep. And this is sometimes if we wait to try to feed them here, it can be really difficult to get them to wake. So we usually try to feed them initially in that initial um, active uh, period of time. Um, they can be in a deep sleep for about two to four hours. You'll see their heart rate and their respiratory rate slower, uh, slow down. Their temperature may fall a little bit. They have bowel sounds, but they're just really hard to wake up during this period of time. Then they can have a separate second period of reactivity. So you're going to see some changes, and, and your textbook gets into these changes in their periods of reactivity. 
Um, and then they can go into a third period of reactivity. So babies have sleep states. They have uh, states in which they're more active than others. I want to talk to you about their behavioral states. Sometimes they're called sleep states. And you can see some differences in babies during this period of time as well. In the alert state, the baby may be drowsy or semi-dozing. They can be wide awake, active awake, or even crying. And this is like so an example of this. You see this baby who's in a sleep state, quiet, the baby's deep, deeply sleeping and usually hard to wake up during this period of time. Then you can have a light sleep where they're kind of they're kind of drowsy, a little bit sleepy. Um, they're but they're you, we can wake them up if we need to, but they're still more on the sleepy side. Drowsy state, I can get them up. They may have like one eye open looking around like, what are you doing to me? Why are you waking me up? But if I need to wake them up to make them eat, I can do so. Then you have awake where the baby is awake and um, they're um, not sleeping. They may be just kind of sucking on their fingers or on their thumbs. And then you have wide awake. And this is the state that's best for bonding where the baby is actively looking around um, and interacting with its environment and where parents can really bond and spend some significant time with their baby. <clears throat> When you look at the different aspects of normal newborn care, they include, and we talked about these already, but APGAR assessment, the uh, mission physical assessment, the gestational age assessment, um, administering vitamin K, administering the prophylactic eye ointment. Um, we will protect the newborn baby's uh, environment. I'll talk to you about a little bit about that in a, in a, a slide or two. Um, we're going to maintain patent airway, make sure that there's nothing in their environment that can occlude their airway, but we also want to promote bonding with the family. And believe it or not, we start teaching mom and dad about uh, taking care of this baby as soon as the baby is born. We start discharge planning before the baby is born. I've given you kind of the protocols before, but every hospital has protocols after delivery, how often a baby is vital signs are assessed. So you just follow the protocols of your hospital. <clears throat> you want to encourage bonding. Once the baby has been dried and, and um, we know that they're breathing and their vital signs and their APGAR scores, all that stuff is fine. Typically, APGAR is done first. Um, we can allow mom to bond with this baby. A lot of times, I'll do the APGAR scores with mom holding the baby, um, which is fine because most baby-friendly facilities want skin-to-skin -skin care during the first hour of birth, and they have very specific protocols for that, and they want to establish early bonding. So we want them to bond with their baby. <clears throat> There has been research in the interactive process between uh, parental bonding and it's important to know that parents start bonding with that baby before that baby is even born. They start connecting with that baby before birth and we are going to assess bonding. But one of the things you'll notice it, when you're assessing bonding in, in the beginning of this process, you'll see how um, moms touch their newborn babies. Um, it's kind of like this getting to know you ritual, how they kind of use their fingertips to trace uh, the contours of the baby, counting the fingers, the toes, feeling the baby's uh, hair and skin. And cradling the baby's body it's it's kind of a touching I'm getting to know you kind of thing that you'll see happening <clears throat> there are predictable interactions of bonding and it's part of our assessment you want to see um, bonding occur we assess for it and we document it you want to see mom and dad talking to this baby, touching this baby, holding this baby, kissing this baby, singing to this baby, or just even holding and looking at this baby. But there are clues and symptoms that bonding is not occurring or there's difficulty and, and potentially problems such as not touching the baby or speaking to the baby. Frankly, lack of interest in the baby. The baby's crying. No one's um, concerned about the baby. Leaving the baby in the nursery for hours on end without even... Um, being concerned about what's happening with the baby. In some instances, you'll see, frankly, ignoring the baby. <clears throat> 
Again, I said to you that skin to skin care is required by baby friendly facilities. It's required for the first hour of birth. If the baby is stable and there's no problems, they're going to put the baby on mom, the baby on mom's bare chest and cover the baby and mom with warm blankets. I don't have time to lecture this to you, but um, you can uh, look up on your own the breast crawl and what that's about. But we're going to try to initiate breastfeeding um, in the labor and delivery room as, as soon as possible. One of the most common, circum uh, most common neonatal surgical procedures is circumcision, uh, and there's very different reasons for choosing to or not to circumcise. It can be due to religious reasons, personal views, views on hygiene, um, family members. A lot of times, they'll if, if dad is circumcised, they'll circumcise the baby. It just there's a variety of reasons to choose, but. Um, we have to consider pain relief when we're doing this procedure. We do know that babies do feel and respond to pain. Believe it or not, when I first came out of school, they did not believe that babies felt pain, so they did not anesthetize them during this procedure. But we know that now research has told us babies feel pain and you need to anesthetize them through this process. It, it's painful. So there's different ways to do this. We can give babies a sweetie solution. They can give them a lidocaine block. They can use some numbing cream such as an Imla cream. And then after the procedure they may do um, post um, circumcision care and give them such as something such as liquid Tylenol. <clears throat> there are different methods to this and your textbook shows you the different methods but you're going to strap the baby down to the uh, papoose board and you have to do this because the the um the physician doing this procedure is holding a scalpel and babies don't follow directions such as i need you to hold still <laughs> so we have to strap their extremities down to the papoose board and we're going to just like any surgical procedure they're going to um, kind of do the stop procedure and stop is this the right baby the right procedure you know what the, just like we would do with any other uh, surgical procedure, they're going to do that as well. Um, and then after the care, after the circumcision is done, you're going to have post-surgical, so post uh, circumcision, excuse me, uh, nursing interventions are going to be done, such as they may wrap the um, penis with uh, Vaseline dressing. Um, they may, um, some hospitals have it within their protocols that right after the procedure you use cloth diapers for the first one or two diaper changes and then they go to using normal diapers. It just depends on what your, your uh, protocols are. Usually for the first 15 or 20 minutes after the procedure I like to keep the baby in the nursery with me so that I can assess and make sure that they're not bleeding and that um, we can clean them up and get them situated to go back out to their families. If the physician chooses to use a, what's called a plastibel, um, it, it's kind of it's, it's sutured in place, then after the procedure you don't have to apply a lot of Vaseline to the baby's diaper site, but if they don't use this, you're going to put Vaseline on that diaper site to keep the head of the penis that's healing from sticking to the diaper. So um, if they use a Plastibel, you don't need to do that. <clears throat> then after, again, the procedure, apply petroleum jelly to the site, comfort the baby, clean them up, assess them frequently for bleeding, use cloth cloth diapers if that is your hospital protocol. If you notice a couple drops of blood you may want to apply gentle pressure um, and it's gentle or you may have to get a, a, an order for like a surgery cell dressing which cut is a little bit of a pressure uh, dressing that will um, apply to that site and then you're going to teach the parents about how to change the baby's diaper that you know they're going to pull back gently um, that they want to use a lot of Vaseline to, to gently clean this area with you know mild uh, soap and water and to have a delicate touch and you're going to show them signs and symptoms that there may be complications afterwards and we're going to teach them about that such as failure to urinate if they see symptoms of infection such as um, purulent or foul smelling drainage <clears throat> If the physician chose to use the plastibel and it, you know, comes loose after a day or so, it needs to be there for at least five to seven days. So, um, or if they have abnormal scarring, 
we want to see the baby again. Those are complications. You want to document how the baby tolerates the procedure um, and when the baby voids after the circumcision and just remember to comfort the baby and know they may be a little bit fussy for the next day or so um, after the procedure. And this is what a healed circumcision site looks like. <clears throat> there is some recent um, research by the American Academy of Pediatrics that are now advocating that the they're advocating for circumcision procedures and basically saying that the benefits of circumcision really outweigh the risks and they are really wanting parents to be more educated on this. They're really actually saying we really suggest that um, little boys be circumcised and they're saying that um, circumcision protects the baby certain against certain sexually transmitted diseases against certain types of cancer such as penile cancer um, it has additional uh, protection against HPV and some other um, uh, problems so they're really advocating for babies now to uh, be circumcised <clears throat> I always like to give you guys a chance to apply, and here is one. A nurse is assessing a newborn infant following a circumcision procedure and notes that the circumcised should be area, I'm sorry, is red with a small amount of bloody drainage. Which of the following nursing actions would be appropriate? A. Contact the physician. B. Apply to no pressure. C. Reinforce the dressing. D. Document the, the finding. Your correct answer would be B, apply gentle pressure. Towards the end of this, I'm, we're coming towards the end of our discussion. I do want to talk to you about infant safety. Um, most hospitals have to protect the infant from infant abduction uh, and preventing from us mixing up the baby, you know, giving the wrong baby to the wrong mom. So before the baby leaves the labor and delivery room, the baby is banded and mom is banded. And there is a number system that is applied to the baby and they all of those those tags have to match. In addition, they put a, a safety tag on the baby that if it loses contact with the baby's skin, it will alarm, like if someone is trying to take a baby out of the facility. So we will uh, try to address that. We'll also, you know, teach um, anybody coming into uh, contact with baby to frequently wash their hands. We want to make much sure mom and dad are aware of the signs of infection um, and that of problems. And we're going to give them a book on how to take care of the baby as well as how to take care of themselves. But um, on uh, baby care in some places, some hospitals will actually do a discharge uh, baby care class for um, moms and dads of babies that are, you know, especially first-time moms who are <clears throat> going to be going home with a new baby. Um, we also now do immersion baths. This is new evidence-based practice. Um, and what they'll do, before we used to teach moms, don't immerse the baby in water before the umbilical cord stump comes off. But now research is saying, no, that's it's fine. We can do this. So they'll do what is called an immersion bath. And um, they will you'll start these in the hospital. And you'll fill a warm basin with warm water. And you'll give them their initial bath. Obviously, their temperature has to be stabilized, um, and we'll give them a warm bath. Um, usually, they'll do this every other day. You're going to do a lot of continued teaching for with your new parents, teaching them how to um, not only bathe their baby, how to dress their baby, how to take the, the baby's temperature, how to care for the umbilical cord site, how to to um, you know how to address visitors, visitors who may be ill. You're going to teach them about the immunizations that the baby needs to have, about how to you know how we're going to weigh the baby and just general baby care, how to hold the baby, position the baby, how to care for the baby's skin. There's a lot for them to learn. In addition, newborn babies before they go home are going to have a hearing test. Um, <clears throat> any baby who is under um, I think it's five pounds, four ounces, has to have a car seat challenge test. We're going to do all of those things. The car seat challenge test is to make sure that they don't asphyxiate on the car seat on, um, and they can handle being in a car seat, you know, on their way home. 
So these are different elements of uh, teaching that we're going to make sure that the parents can do before, you know, before discharge. And we have to sign off on this because this is part of the educational record that we work with them on. And then they're going to do a new newborn screening assessment. This is a test that's required by law. You have to wait till the baby's at least 20, uh, 24 hours old. And they're going to test for over 30 diseases, um, including PKU, hypothyroidism, galactosemia, sickle cell, etc. But basically, just to give you an example of what these disorders are, it's disorders that need to have early, early identification so we can prevent long-term problems. For example, galactosemia is one of those disorders. Newborn babies, some babies cannot metabolize a protein in milk, which is galact it's called galactosemia. And um, if this baby has this condition, they can't metabolize galactolose and that unmetabolized sugar and protein will build up in the baby's body and it will cause damage to the baby's liver, to the eyes, the kidneys, and brain, and the baby will have brain damage, they'll develop cataracts and blindness, they'll develop liver damage and kidney damage. But if we, if the baby tests positive for this and we know this, they're just going to change the type of formula uh, that the baby eats. This is how this test is done. They're going to prick the baby's heel and they're going to fill these little circles on a um, newborn screening kit. And then this is sent to the state lab to test for these conditions. <clears throat> Finally, I want to talk to you about neonatal abstinence syndrome. And this is where babies are born exposed to drugs in utero, um, whether it be heroin, whether it be cocaine, um, and various other drugs. You can have a baby who is born going through withdrawal. Some of those symptoms that you'll see is the baby will have a really high-pitched cry. They can have seizures, temperature instability, um, tremors. They can be very jittery, um, problems sleeping, uh, they can have GI problems, sneezing, and feeding difficulties. Typically, if the, we know that the baby has NAS, you have an NAS scoring or assessment that you have to do, and you have to do this periodically throughout the day. They'll have very specific times when it needs to be done. And based on your assessment findings, they may have medications that may be needing, that may need to be given to the baby that is actively withdrawing. And then you're going to be fielding a lot of questions um, from new parents. A lot of what you do besides newborn care and postpartum care of the mom is you're doing a lot of education. Um, so you're going to play a role as not just caregiver, caregiver but also educator. So some key points from this content, newborn babies are all in a state of transition. All body systems are transitioning. The registered nurse is consistently assessing for symptoms of stable transition enormously when you're working with newborn babies who are adapting. And um, we want to make sure that moms and dads understand how to care for their babies. So I'm going to end with a joke. I just thought the slide was cute and it says, you will not believe what happened to me last night. All right, guys, thank you. And if you have questions, let me know.